So hello everyone and welcome tonight to our monthly speaker sessions here in August. Um, we're glad to see all of you with us tonight. Um, I'm Renee Rogers. I'm the head curator at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum. And um, my colleague, Tony Doman, is in the background running the tech right now. Um, we're excited because tonight we are hosting Dr. Brian Pierce, who will be talking to us about the work of the National Museum of African American Music. Um, someone we have wanted to talk to for a very long time. They only opened recently, so this is a big treat for us. Um, before we get started, though, I have just a few housekeeping details to share with you. Um, please be sure and turn off your video and your microphone because this will help optimize the experience for everyone. Um, there will be a Q&A afterwards, so you are welcome to share your questions with Dr. Pierce, and you can do that in the chat. Tony will be keeping an eye on the chat and sharing out those questions afterwards. So be sure and um, think up some good ones because I'm sure he would love to hear your thoughts and questions. Um, I will be sending a survey out afterwards. We always like to get your feedback after one of these programs. It really does help us a lot to um, improve each time and to figure out some of the topics that you all are interested in. So please be sure and share your thoughts on those. We'll send those out in the next couple of days. And then finally, please consider sharing a donation after tonight's program. The link is in the chat. The museum offers mostly free or low cost programming to our community and any donations will help us to keep those programs accessible and engaging. And we really appreciate that support. Before we jump into our conversation with Dr. Pierce, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction to him. Dr. Brian Pierce is the curator at the of the National Museum of African American Music. He previously held the position of digital archivist at Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas. In both his academic work and as a museum professional, Brian has specialized in subterranean African American aesthetics in music and decorative arts. He pursued a PhD from Arkansas State University and throughout his time at ASU, Brian worked at the Southern Tenant Farmers Museum. He was also on the exhibition development team for the boyhood home of Johnny Cash, who everyone knows is one of our, our hometown favorites. And after completing his doctorate, Brian accepted an assistant registrar curator position with the Department of Arkansas Heritage before move, moving on to the National Museum of African American Music. Welcome, Brian. We're very glad to have you with us. And for everyone, we're going to have about, um, Brian's going to tell us a little bit about the museum and about the work that they do. And then he and I will segue into a conversation. And then, like I said, there'll be time for questions afterwards. But welcome, Brian. We're so glad to have you here with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate you so much, Dr. Rogers. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, this is awesome. I love these type of experiences. Um, so I kind of developed the kind of tour slash discussion tonight around a conversation I had with Dr. Rogers when we first met. Um, so it's a little bit about selections um, and somewhat the difficulties that uh, museums, especially smaller scale museums, and even a new museum like ourselves go through, but creative ways you can go around it. So uh, I'll start by saying we are relatively young. We were established, well, we, we've been a work in progress for almost 20 years and we opened up in 2021. Uh, so that was right after uh, COVID was really rocking the nation, but they chose to pursue on and they have, I think they've done very well, I'll say we. I've been with the museum now for one year and I've enjoyed every moment of it. So, uh, but one thing that sometimes um, a little bit of an issue is collecting of objects. And I think for about five years, they were working really hard to collect objects. And again, anyone that's familiar with medium to smaller museums, it's hard to collect items. I was recently on a panel with the Smithsonian and it was in regards to uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the new African American Museum through the Smithsonian. Amazing, beautiful museum. And their collection is kind of jaw dropping. And I, I wish we had a quarter of the objects that you have. Um, so, but the thing is, it's hard for medium to smaller museums to collect. So, the main thing that we have to be familiar with 
is how we collect and how do we creatively kind of provide context to a story that's interesting and engaging for our populations. So first, I'll show you this slide. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea of our museum. Uh, these are our main galleries. It's the main gallery for a permanent uh, exhibit. Uh, so we start off with the top left, and that is our Rivers of Rhythm. And that's basically the spine of the museum. It shows how basically the genre and the genres that we kind of cover in the museum is a flowing kind of experience. And we're probably going to get into that a little bit deeper in this discussion uh, later on uh, within the discussion with me and Dr. Rogers. So, uh, but that's the beginning of the museum experience. Then you go to the lower where that's weight in the water. That's a beginning stage as far as uh, spiritual music. So we focus from beginning eras of spiritual music to contemporary gospel. Then the next um, genre that we focus on is uh, crossroads where it's blues music. And from there we go to a uh, love supreme that's jazz and that's in the corner uh, right hand. And then above that, we have uh, One Nation Under a Groove, which is our R&B section. And then above that, we have the message. So I think the big thing to notice, we are not object heavy. Uh, we have uh, some beautiful objects from Whitney Houston uh, dresses to uh, Lisa Left Eye Lopez last outfit that she ever performed in. Um, at one point, we had B.B. King's uh, Lucille guitar, but that was on loan because, again, it's hard to get those objects and keep those objects. So, again, being creative of how you kind of uh, present the stories, because we, we do collect oral histories. And while developing the museum, we went out and we asked people about those interesting stories and how we can incorporate that in a larger narrative. So how can we present that? Um, I think it's number one rule of heritage, finding a balance of uh, informing and also a presentation of history. So we do that heavily through interactives. Um, that one interactive we're gonna talk a little bit deeper in, uh, deeper about is uh, Rivers of Rhythm right there to your top. And it's a tabletop interactive that kind of shows the flow. Um, and I'm gonna actually hold off on saying uh, too much more because I'll go in depth a little bit later. Uh, but we always kind of get critiqued as far as you're missing this and you're missing this. So we kind of really explore that through our feature gallery. So that's our changing gallery that's at the beginning of our uh, museum experience after you uh, complete your uh, primary gallery slash permanent gallery. To the right, we have a 2000, 2,378 square foot room. Um, it's beautiful. And we have our changing gallery. And one of my first big exhibits, they came to me a month into me working at the museum. It's like, hey, uh, we have our 50th anniversary of hip hop. We need an exhibit for the entire year. And your budget is non-existent. So how can we actually do this? How can we pull off full year of hip hop presentation. So one of our, the one section of our museum as far as the genres that we have the fewest items as far as material culture is the message gallery. That's our hip hop gallery. Now with that message gallery, again, it, it, it's very small. And I think because when you think about material culture items, uh, early on, when you're looking at blues or not so much jazz, but even when you're looking at, uh, let's say, that yes. spiritual yes. Era, uh, era. Turn the, uh, the reheating of our. Uh, oh. Okay. okay. Uh, when you're thinking about that spiritual era, you're thinking about functional objects. So you're thinking about the utility of the objects. So you don't necessarily think automatically as. Uh, value. Um, but with that kind of progression to the mid 20th century, people have a bigger understanding of 
oh, this object might matter. When you're looking, thinking at Bo Dilley's washboard, uh, no one's thinking that cost. So people were willing to give those objects. With hip hop, they've actually put value on those materials. So you're looking at uh, LL Cool J's Dookie chain. Dookie chain's the large ghetto uh, gold kind of uh, chains that have big rings on. And they asked for these big numbers as far as like, I want $50,000. So I thought the big thing that would be nice was, why don't we focus on oral histories and also uh, these documentarians of hip hop culture? So I think the main thing when we're talking about these uh, predecessors and people that come before us, they might not have the material culture which might cost um, $50,000, $100,000 to give. They, they probably don't have those objects but they do want to have these conversations and talk and make sure their voices are heard and those stories are preserved for the next generation. So I reached out to four different documentarians to be basically representative of four different regions of uh, the United States. So we're doing an exhibit on uh, West Coast, uh, Midwest, South and East. Uh, I thought, why don't we look at these individuals that oftentimes never get recognized and then provide context to these iconic images and allow them to provide the context and let them be focused on. So this is an example of our feature gallery and how I kind of structured it. It's broken up into various sections. So wall B and then the wall right to it, wall C, that's uh, basically what I call on it information units. With the information units, you have an image and then you have some type of interpretive panel that actually explains the image. And then we have a smaller box where we have a few material culture items, specifically tools of those uh, different documentaries to explain and give context of why those tools matter. And it's also the evolution of those tools when capturing oral histories. And then we have uh, AV wall where we can give the artists a bigger opportunity to explain the, like the evolution of their work. So we might only have, uh, let's say 15 interpretive panels of various pieces. On that AV wall, we might have 500 different items that they produced during their time period because they can uh, give the audience a bigger example of their work. Uh, so, I thought that was really important because again, we oftentimes want to present, well, and I show the objectives because we're still working in a place where uh, with a lot of mid and small museums, that still is an event space with us. So we do hold, uh, uh, I think we've had two album releases. We have uh, speaker engagements. So we still ramp that space as far as that gallery. And it gives that space an elevated experience because people can learn at the same time, they can have uh, an event there. So I think and this is an example of our West Coast and Tracy Bartlow was the artist that was featured in the exhibit. So uh, again, you can see that wall is what we consider the information and again, it's a lot of it's more hard work versus just focusing on those material culture items. And audiences really do engage because they notice they're getting some an experience that oftentimes is not recognized. Yeah, there is a lot of ooh and ahs, like LL Cool J's boom box. Yeah, that's great. But sometimes you need to hear those stories that you're not gonna hear anywhere else other than these people that are capturing the, of these images for that next generation. And this is an example of the artwork. This is Andre Leroy Davis. He's our East Coast uh, documentarian. And that's one of his pieces of Pup Day. And to the side, I'm showing an example of how he provide his interpretive panel of the piece. And these are four documentarians. And uh, again, so we have Andre Leroy Davis to the left, Mr. Raymond Boyd to the top, Ms. Tracy Bartlow, West Coast to the right, and then Shannon McCollum, who will be our representative for the South. 
And I thought that was really important to kind of give these individuals a voice and allow them to receive their flowers, their respect while they're here. Because oftentimes we focus on the individuals after they're gone. So let's respect these individuals now. And I think everyone deserves to have a platform for them. So um, that was a very small kind of uh, example of what our music museum is and how we're trying to convey those stories for the next generation. So from here, I will kind of throw it to Dr. Rogers and let's get on to those questions. Well, so Brian, it's funny, I was in DC this weekend and went to the African American Museum of History and Culture and you are correct, they are, the amount of material culture and objects that they have on display is just incredible. We only got to see three of the gap, we only three of the levels, we didn't even get to all of the levels and we were there for like four hours. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think I saw uh, Chuck Berry's Cadillac there. I was like, oh my gosh, like and some of the things that they have, it's beautiful, but your standard museum, they can only hope to get maybe one of those items. When you yeah. start numbers like $150,000 for Miles Davis's, well, I mean like that, it, it's kind yeah. of scary. Well, and I think, you know, we've discovered this as a music museum ourselves, is that when you are a music museum, those interactives are such, and the storytelling behind the people and the songs and the music, um, those have as much impact really as the material culture. So, you know, with a music museum, those interactives mean a lot. Um, so I, I, I'm excited to, to come and, and explore that. And, you know, we're excited now. We're going to jump into, so Brian has just given us sort of an overview of what the museum is and what it does and, and how they got to where to where they were, they're open. But we wanted to talk about some of the stories, the artists and the music that are highlighted in the museum. And you touched on some of those, but we have, um, I just want to first look at the context um, because you know, we, a lot of people imagine that museums are about the past and that that's all that they're about. And of course, we know that's not true. And probably a lot of our audience today also knows that that's not true. So how does um, your museum connect the historic Black musical traditions with the music we listen to today? I mean, you talked a little bit about the different galleries that sort of take us through not necessarily a chronological timeline, but a thematic timeline, I suppose. And how do you like talk about how those traditions and those um, genres have shaped American music as a whole? So I think there's two ways. I think the first one has to be, is it's actually an interactive. So we have two major interactives that are go-tos where everyone's really excited and they spend hours on. One is the large, well, spine of the museum that's the uh, rivers of river. Um, so we have one called Roots and Streams. Roots and Streams is basically you select the artist, let's say uh, Nelco New, uh, Dr. Dre. Mm -hmm. So you see Dr. Dre and then you hear his bio, you can listen to his music. And then from there, you see his influences and who he uh, who influenced him. And then you press that person and it shows that connection. And it shows like, because this is the thing where we talk about community. Oftentimes community is a very loose uh, terminology because I had a professor one time, I was kept saying community, community, community. It's like, be careful how you use the word community. Because again, is it agreed upon understanding between you and that other person or is it loose or is someone else establishing that? So I think we definitely establish that because we recognize aesthetic similarities, the connection to similar technology, uh, mm -hmm. like also even shouting out like, oh yeah, I really appreciate this person and then recognizing that through some form of airing view or, so we're finding all the links and then connecting it through this interactive where you can see that lineage of how you can get from Dr. Dre to how you can get to Ray Charles, even if it's through a sample. So I think that interactive is an amazing one. Now, secondly, I think it has to do with the instrumentation. So when you think about the beginning stages of kind of our experience, even going to Wade in the Water, and even in our theater, Roots Theater is our beginning stage where we have like a 20 minute intro video for the whole museum. 
and we have issuance, we have after issuance. And then, so getting an understanding about like the banjo and the, that instrument is a very interesting and it caused arguments and the banjo and the fiddle itself. So there is an instrument that's very close to what we consider the banjo. The banjo, we know uh, Gibson established a five string banjo that is what we consider the modern day banjo. But there was an African instrument called the Conti that was very similar to the banjo. And yes, it did have some type of influence to it. And the early slaves that came to the United States used that instrument and that progressed and developed the sound. So even using the fiddle and the, that type of uh, banjo at that time together with those errors in, well, pre-emancipation, I think that's the funny thing about it. those are the first kind of string instruments and string bands. And then when you think about like that being a part of the story and understanding the evolution of those instruments and how they're incorporated in various types of genres, even also techniques. So the slurring of the violin playing. Uh, yeah, I think that's so funny because violin playing and field playing are so similar. And it's how you play the techniques, and the sounds of it that really change it from, and we're gonna get probably into a little bit deeper genre, but it's even when I was thinking about this earlier when I was uh, thinking about the slurring of a violin. Because even when you think about rock and roll and the rock and roll, think of Rolling Stones specifically, they were very heavily like, no, we love Chuck Berry, he's our guy, blah, blah, blah. But when you think of some uh, a band like Megadeth or some of those really metal bands from the 80s, they were so against saying we're the antithesis of blues music. We're going against that. But when you think about them bending those notes, they were doing the same thing. So I think that also goes to the point that we want to further ourselves so much sometimes in what we say, but we're still just reestablishing. We're all interconnected in these aesthetics and we're all growing. So uh, technology and also tools that we tell the story of in the museum. I think that's what we do. Yeah, and you know, I'm skipping ahead to a different question because you've mentioned genre a few times. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, we talk a little bit about that in our museum. And, you know, a lot of people, like you said, there's this imagined strict boundary between genres that blues music is blues music, rock music is rock music, um, country music is country music. Um, and a lot of that, of those musical styles and categories, they're not really a true reflection of who is listening to and making that music. It's not a true reflection of who's being influenced and, and influencing. What it is is a marketing, it's a marketing term and it's used to imagine an audience that is gonna specifically buy that music more than the fact that that's how it actually works out. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned a lot of, of that about, a little bit about that sort of, when you were talking about Megadeth, thinking that they're 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 completely separate from that. But just can you tell us a few of the stories um, that are in the museum that sort of really exemplify that power of those influences across genres where you can really see something that's interesting between those genres? So I think I think the biggest discussion we're probably going to talk about when saying that is race music versus hillbilly. So we all probably everybody on this uh, knows that in the 1920s record labels went out and they specifically developed these genres and labels uh, to kind of distinguish what black people were listening to and what white people were listening to. The thing that we really don't talk about though, I think is a problem is the fact that we don't talk about class when we talk about these genres. One, my favorite genre is folk, not specifically what we recognize as folk, especially not contemporary folk of 1950s and 60s. And, um, I think of the people, just the concept of for the people and the functionality of it and the utility of it, and the purpose and the agenda. So when we talk about like that 1920s, 1930s, and there's a sharing of music, Yes, there was a lot of, so I, I have to be careful on how I talk about this. One, because 
you are talking about a time period where people were being persecuted at the same time because there's a lot of what was taking place. One, the North was and were playing a game as far as with these African Americans that chose not to take their agency and two other uh, labels that we don't talk about are rural versus urban. So some of these African Americans that choose not to move to the city, choose not to move to the North. Why are you gonna move to the North? There's so much better for you here. Like there's so many more opportunities. You must be ignorant. You must be exclusively of that sharecropping class. There's no like for you to stay there and they fought with fame about some of the people that stayed in Appalachia. Like if you're gonna stay in Appalachia, oh, you must be ignorant. Why would you love a place like that? There's no culture there. But that's a lie. This is home for these people. And they found this method of surviving and loving who they were in these environments. And I think that is something that's shared among this, and I don't wanna call it lower culture, but I'll call it the culture of the folk, of the people. These people that work in the mines, the people that work in sharecropping uh, communities. So if you, you see from my history, I spent a lot of time in uh, Eastern Arkansas, specifically the Delta. And the demographics have changed a lot, but the main thing to recognize about East Arkansas is it's sharecropping central. Southern Ten Farmers Union was the first integrated union established in the United States, even though the Grange might have uh, had uh, African Americans, they just never stated it and never explained that they were uh, integrated. But the thing that people recognize, and I did projects there where I would do oral histories, and I would interview an African American gentleman and a white gentleman of the same age that were both from a sharecropping class, and I never told them what I was exactly doing, but I asked them the exact same questions. And it was, it was interesting how similar everything they said was, from what they ate, from the music they listened to, from their experiences of going to school, what they learned at school. But it was that push by you know, different entities trying to push people away because they wanted to have this perception of uh, this, you are better and then entitlement, but these people were just trying to make the best that they could. And I think that's the main thing, even with initial stages of the uh, sub Tent Farmers Museum, uh, 18 members, uh, seven black, 11 white, where some of those initial white members were former Klansmen. So they changed their talking points once they recognized they were sharecroppers and they were being persecuted the exact same way these African-Americans. And they understood they had to work together. And I think that's the thing, even with music, they recognize their similarities as far as their aesthetic, what they were talking about, the hardships, and they put it through music. And that's where you develop these aesthetics and these storylines that were so similar. Mm -hmm. So I, the genres as far as blues, country, they don't matter, it's what they're trying to convey. And I think we do do that in the museum, and oftentimes people say, you never touch on, uh, you don't talk about country music. It's like, no, country music's talked about in the museum, but you have to look behind the actual label. Ray mm -hmm. Charles is a country musician. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald had those country uh, hits. So you have to look beyond the genre, understanding it was all a ploy as far as why we kind of link these terminologies to these people. Yeah. And we've got a, an exhibit right now on women in old time music. And one of the women that I got really excited about that I didn't know anything about before we did the research was Lottie Kimbra um, from Kansas City Blues. But, uh, you know, she's in the 1920s and very much classified as blues. But there's yodeling, there's banjo, which was a little bit unusual at that time. Certainly, I mean, the banjo wasn't very prevalent in blues at that time necessarily. And I just, I love that there's this connections between the genres that you wouldn't expect and that really do talk about something much more deeper than, than people imagine when they think about the different types of music. And I think it's, I think that's what makes your museum sound so interesting is that by going through those thematic um, spaces, those connections can probably be made in really interesting ways. 
So let's talk a little bit about, you know, you mentioned the different galleries and the different focuses and, and you know, you're looking from early spirituals to the blues, from jazz to hip hop and everything in between. <laughs> um, so just tell us a few of what you consider some of the important or particularly interesting stories that are explored in these galleries, just about specific musicians or art, or, or if there is an artifact that sort of stands out to you, tell us a few of those stories. So I think um, for me, and that's the reason why I love the, how the museum kind of flows as far as uh, way noir to the message. Uh, my background, I'm a historian. Right? I'm just a musician and I love, I'm not an ethnog uh, ethnomusicologist. I'm an ethnographer. Um, and I'm just a musician and I play in bands my entire life. But one thing that I really do focus on as far as my research is migration patterns. And I think migration patterns are very important as far as how you tell the story of music. So uh, with African Americans specifically, when you look at our crossroads section and also our Love Supreme section, which is blues and Love Supreme jazz, you have to think about agency. Um, that's very important to talk about uh, because again, the story begins with the emancipation. So you're talking about 1865. This is the first opportunity for African-Americans to move. Uh, you have your establishment of historical black colleges and universities in the United States. Uh, here in, uh, in Nashville, you have Fisk University, that was very important. Um, you have Tuskegee. And Tuskegee and Hampton were kind of a little bit the outliers because they were still, especially Tuskegee, were very rural environments uh, in the South. And Booker T. Washington was very much, even though it was what we consider the black belt, uh, he was a pioneer in saying you can stay here and uplift yourself. Uh, but giving African-Americans the opportunity to go to these locales and these institutions and then learn. And um, from there, you have to think about this. These individuals went to New York City. They went to California. And then they were able to establish uh, these genres, or not even establish the genres, evolve the genres. So we think about Harlem Renaissance as far as uh, the jazz era in the 1910s and 20s. But you have also have to think about Congo Square in 1830 and 1840 as far as those jazz roots. And then it took that migration pattern, those individuals learning the basics from there. And they're also incorporating the church and the spirituality and the techniques that they learned in the church and then evolve it from there within these clubs and uh, different clubs throughout uh, New Orleans. And then uh, and from there moving to San Francisco and from there moving and choosing to move to New York City. So that's the reason why when you think about these migration patterns, people, uh, especially when you think of blues, how many African-Americans chose to uh, go on that train of the Delta and go up to Chicago, South Side of Chicago, and establish those muddy waters and the, those sounds that really carved out what we recognize as modern day blues in the 40s and 50s and 60s. So I think recognizing, understanding those stories through our museum and how people claim their agency to uh, develop these genres in other environments other than the South that's important. It also shows that evolution to people being able to create new genres. And I think it is a new genre like hip hop, where it wasn't in a bubble. A lot of people want to say these genres start in a bubble. They don't. Um, it, take, it took people taking courage and then finding their path to make sure these stories were worldwide. Because again, you have to think about one of those earliest stories. As far as storytelling, I'm sorry, I have a major shine on me right now. <laughs> um, uh, one of those stories as the Fish Jubilee Singers in Nashville, Tennessee, where it was Queen Elizabeth that uh, made the, that saying, no, this it wasn't Queen Elizabeth. It was the Queen of England at the time, where she uh, made the, was it Queen Victoria? Um, so what, what was the date? So it was 18, was it? Yeah, that would be Queen, yeah, that would have been Queen Victoria then, yeah. It was from Queen Victoria, yeah. 
So when she made the point of calling uh, Nashville Music City just because of this Jubilee Singers. So I think that's a point where African Americans claiming their agency to move, to travel, even if it's through Bonderville, and then even after the Bonderville uh, circuit was closed and then establishing the Chitlin circuit. So having that, uh, I mean, I'll say even like courage to continue on in environments where it was somewhat dangerous for them, but they recognize we have an opportunity to do something special. And uh, I think that migration and also the agency that they took to do that is very important. Well, and can you just explain to our audience what the Chitlin circuit is? Cause they might not be familiar with that. Awesome, yeah. So the Chitlin circuit initially started in, let's say 19, it wasn't called the Chitlin circuit. It was established, the Bonderville trail that was established in like 1910s. And that was really uh, big in the 19 teens to the twenties. And by almost the depression era, it was, basically sold out and lost. So the linkage of clubs and venues through different cities, uh, all the way through the Midwest, uh, places in Illinois, and then especially in the South, that was safe for African-Americans to perform at. And there were these big theaters, now there's multiple theaters in Nashville that were a part of the circuit. But once those uh, that circuit was closed, uh, that same touring, uh, Matt was still there and they played those same uh, venues. So a lot of what we call the Air entertainment districts in the African-American community in Nashville, it would be Jefferson Street. Uh, in, let's say, Little Rock, Arkansas, it would be 9th Street. Uh, in Atlanta, it would be Auburn Avenue. Uh, so it continued on, but instead of calling it, because it wasn't one network, it wasn't one a company that owned this linkage of venues, uh, it was called the Chipman Circuit. So it was just a safe passage for African Americans to perform and it lasted all the way up to, I think one of the biggest stories is Ray Charles choosing to not perform there in, uh, on it anymore because he feels that African Americans should have the opportunity to perform in any venue they wanted. So that was also a catalyst during what we consider the civil rights uh, era and civil rights movement for African Americans to recognize we can perform in places beyond just this children's circuit. Yeah, and you just mentioned the civil rights era. So um, this is not a question I prepared you for, Brian, but I'm going to throw it in there. <laughs> is you know I, one of the things that we that I find so there's so many things about the civil rights era that are interesting, but the use of music in protest within that movement is really important. Do you tell some of those stories? What kind of stories about that do you all tell in the museum? So I, yes, and then I, I think this is the point where we do tell those stories from James Brown's performances to uh, Ray Charles choosing not to perform at certain venues. Um, and then certain artists, I, I think, so I'll jump to another artist that I want to talk about because he is a country musician. Uh, and I think we probably all know who he is, D4 Bailey. Mm -hmm. uh, D4 Bailey is an important figure as far as race relations. And I think even to this day, we are still trying to correct some of, I don't want to call it wrongs, but D4 Bailey in 1928, he performed on the Grand Ole Opry radio station, WSM, more than any other person that year. And he was a staple of what we consider that uh, country scene all the way up until like 1939, uh, 1940. And I think the excuse was given at that point. Uh, he's not making any new songs. We're going to get rid of your contract and you're done. That's a disservice uh, to him. And I think recognizing that where by 1950s there was this attempt to continue to separate, but people persevere. And you look at Charlie Pride, and you look at Ray Charles, and continue to recognize we're going to release these albums and prove that there is a link and similarity between us, and we are connected. And I think 
it was basically enforcing what Dr. Martin Luther King was speaking on. We are not so different in what we speak on. And, and I think even to this day, we'll have modern era uh, athletes and artists where they don't want to speak outright because they want to symbolize more than be outspoken because one, maybe they cannot provide that straightforward kind of answer. But proving that there should be this egalitarian equality recognized amongst people. So uh, I think similar to the protests in Memphis I was taken with the sanitation workers. Through their music, they were saying, I am, and they should have said human, but um, they are man, I am man. Um, and they were announcing that through their music and how they performed it, recognized me as an artist, not a black artist, Mm -hmm. Just, I think that speak more statements because sometimes people don't want to have that conversation as far as uh, what it means to be black or white as an artist. They just want to be recognized as an artist. And I think D4 Bailey is a perfect example of that. For so long, he wasn't recognized as a black artist. And I think during his heyday, he was recognized as an artist. And I think even when you look at other artists, that influence uh, Leslie Riddle, uh, uh, Rufus Payne, that influence these artists, they weren't thinking about them being black artists that are influencing the Carter family or a white artist that's uh, influencing Hank Williams. They're just artists. So I think that's how you really claim um, civil rights of that era because sometimes they will only focus on, oh, you have an agenda. Or oftentimes that separation of people was because there was an agenda. Right. Well, so you, you mentioned um, D. Ford Bailey, which is a, a great connection to country music, and Leslie Riddle also because of the work he did with A.P. Carter. And he's, he's one of our favorite stories. Um, but tell us a little bit more about some of the artists that um, you all talk about in your museum that do connect to country music, because obviously our, our audience is, is country music focused a little bit, so we'd love to hear some more of those stories. So I'll go back to my one of my statements. I was recently on a panel that talked about uh, our conversations as far as country music. We don't have a country music uh, genre in our museum. And we are somewhat slight as far as who we talk about in country music. We do have the big names. We have Darius Rucker in the museum. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Carolina Chocolate Drops in the museum. Yeah. And I think Dom Fleming, what he's doing, we work with him. What he's doing as far as uh, cowboy music, as far as black cowboy, it's amazing. And he's just a brilliant man. I love talking to him. So, uh, but we're doing it through our program. And also our partnership with Vanderbilt right now, uh, we are hopefully not going to work on different projects with different people, possibly Reese Palmer and different uh, musicians where we want to expand on who we talk about in the museum as far as country music. We don't have a country music session, but again, it's because you have to recognize those people are in our community. We do have a large session dedicated to Ray Charles. We do have a large session to uh, Ella Fitzgerald. And we work really closely with uh, Carlos Bailey. So that's D4 Bailey's grandson. And he does harmonica classes uh, through the museum. Yeah, and I love it. I, I, it gives younger audiences uh, understanding where I think so often, especially we talk to younger African-American kids, it's like, oh, that's not for us. Like harmonica, what? That's not an instrument for us. And giving context why this is important and then who he was and having him speak to uh, these kids, that really provides a new opportunity for us to explain that connection from uh, harmonica can be used for blues, jazz, even rock and roll. And then showing that through these programs, and we're doing better, hopefully, every day as far as developing those connections and providing uh, those programs that inform the public to do so. 
Well, and let's let's talk about Ray Charles just real quick, because that's someone that I think people would not imagine a connection to country music. But of course, he did an entire country album. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and there's a really iconic, a couple of iconic pictures I've seen of him with Johnny Cash and um, some other artists like that. So I think I think he's a really interesting one. He is. And I, I think uh, I, I'm not gonna lie, I love the movie Ray. And I show up, I think that's the one thing where I say genre is a little ridiculous. And personally, I think uh, genre now, not, not ridiculous, I'll take that. Because I think subcategories, because I'm a musician myself and I'm not in what you consider typical, uh, like uh, when people say, oh, that's black music. I hate when people say black music or white music. I do indie rock music and I do something called noise music and uh, neo contemporary like, classical music. So, but I always kind of find influence to my roots as far as. Uh, I was heavily uh, influenced by jazz and soul music and R&B. So find something that's connected to you and then provide a new spin. That pushes the bar to develop new genres and new categories. I think that's the reason why genre today is important because it's showing people are invested in expanding the existing uh, format as far as what is being performed and how it can be performed. So even when you think of uh, the different subgenres of country music, they're there. I think uh, MJ Larson is one, um, one in a lot of stuff they're doing in Asheville, North Carolina right now. It's amazing as far as pushing the bar of what's recognized as country music. So um, it, yeah, uh, breaking those boundaries, Ray Charles definitely did. He was not just an r and Singer. He was not just a soul singer. He like he understood everything's the opportunity to learn the basics and then evolve, like evolve the sound to develop that next step. Let's we'll see where we can go. Yeah, and um, we have a sort of an artist that's from around here. I mean, she's originally from Chattanooga, but Amethyst Kia, who yeah. has been on the Grand Ole Opry now twice, and you know she started off. She born in. Chattanooga moved to J Johnson City, did her um, country bluegrass old time studies at ETSU and is really influenced by some of those early sounds um, and is now this, I mean, she's always been an amazing artist, but she is such a wonderful conglomeration of different types of music. And it just really thrills us to see that she's been on the Grand Ole Opry now twice where we all are so proud of her. <laughs> that, then we can sort of claim her as our own from down here. You deserve to. <laughs> I moderated a conversation between her and Don Fleming about, I would say, like two months ago. And that was, a, yeah, it was an amazing conversation. Like, that was really I can cool. imagine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but before we go into our last two questions, you mentioned Don Fleming's and Black Cowboys. Can you tell people a little bit about that? Because that is such an interesting sort of project that he's been working on for quite a while now. Well, so I, I think this is great. With the Black Cowboy movement, one personal person that is a superhero for me is the Lone Well, people, a specific one, but the Lomax family. Uh, Alan Lomax is he's one of those people I've always looked up to as far as and his father, uh, the original John Lomax, with the cowboy genre music. And it's very based in Texas at that point because they're a Texan family. So um, so I was really unfamiliar with like black cowboy music, and especially and even now, I am not one of those people that can really talk on it because I was only familiar with the work like the Library of Congress and with the Lomax family did with cowboy music. So when I heard kind of like Donald's doing something, I was like, what? And I think that is really important. And I think that was a big catalyst for us. We have partnership with Air Development. And last year, we actually went out and we bought Don Fleming's collection. So a lot of those notebooks, as far as uh, the African-American cowboy music, it, it's all a part of this uh, collaboration with Vanderbilt and us. And instead of me sitting here and talking off my head about it, because I only know surface level about it, I urge you to look it up on Vanderbilt's uh, 
website, uh, the collaboration between us, and you can actually see the gambit of work he's done with Black Cowboy music because it's actually amazing. And that's a big reason why I'm so excited because oftentimes, again, it costs big money to do these amazing projects. And I'm very happy with our partnership with Bear Duel. We have the opportunity to explore different genres that's unfamiliar with us, and we're hoping we can expand more upon the future. And for our audience, I'll make sure that we get that link and put it in the email when we send the survey out so that you can awesome. find it easily. And the other thing I would say, if um, he also has the album with Smithsonian Folkways with Black music, black Cowboy Music. Um, mm -hmm. So that's also a good, a good link with, that we'll send through. Um, so we have two more questions and just a little bit more time together. So first off, what is and I know you said you're not artifact heavy. So I've said, what, what is your favorite artifact or who is your favorite artist that is featured in the museum? Just a personal, what personally gets you excited? Okay, so I, I'm gonna do a little cheat here. Um, I'm gonna go back to hip hop and our feature galleries that we have for this year. Um, I recently talked on a panel about this. So it's a Canon AE-1 camera. Um, why is that important? because it was given to us by Raymond Boyd. So when I showed you the different photographers that are in our hip hop exhibit, our changing gallery, he provided his camera that he took these pictures of these iconic hip hop artists. So I think by itself, it doesn't matter. You have this camera, you don't understand. It's like, oh, it's an old camera, still camera. It doesn't even have video one. Um, so I think the point where we can provide and give context of why this is important, why this individual is important. Um, that is, is, that's something uh, that needs to happen because museums have the power today where everybody is so concerned with the rise of barrage wars and also uh, the American picker. Everyone thinks these old objects are very important. But sometimes these objects that might only cost $100, once you have the context, the historical context of why this matters and who these people are, I think that truly provides your audience an understanding of why oral histories are still important. Mm -hmm. So often people say, it doesn't matter, you don't have to go out and talk to people anymore. It's only, you can, and that was the thing about even that Smithsonian project. We were so happy about talking about all these amazing objects that cost $100,000, $150,000. It's not always about that because it's the stories that are not at the forefront, but should be. And it's these objects that you can just pass by and you don't have an understanding what the true story is behind them until you actually speak to a person. So some of these individuals that are 80 and 90 years old and have these like uh, trunks of images and they can provide those con or the context of those images as far as why this moment matters. Mm -hmm. Like who are these people in this image? Those are items and oh my gosh, every time I see a box of just like uh, pictures, or like today I found a box of pictures that was kind of under the table. I was like, ooh, I was happy because that, that kind of gives you that opportunity, like we're gonna do work. We're gonna research and find out what is next, who these people are and why they work. So yeah, that camera is important to me because it, it's a hook to understanding why uh, that image is important. Right. Yeah. So, and finally, Brian, when visitors leave the National Museum of African American Music, um, what new or deeper understanding do you hope that they've gained from being there? So I, I think where, and this is going to be funny when me saying this, where the title of the museum is a little bit of an outline. It's not, uh, it's, it is correct as far as National Museum of African American Music, but it's not specifically where people might present. This is Black music music or it's museum about black people. It's not. It's about basically how African Americans have influenced music in general and how we're all interconnected. So how even the connections to uh, Bo Dilley can be recognized to Elvis Presley mm -hmm. and specifically Will Richard to Elvis Presley. 
but it's not just for African Americans, it's for all people. It's for all people. And it, it's not just about R&B music. Like we have that R&B session. It was also how that R&B session can link to country music that oftentimes isn't recognized when you recognize black people. So I think that's the thing I want people to come away with when they come to the museum, recognizing, oh, wait a minute, this isn't a museum about black people. It's about how certain influences within the African-American community influence the candidate in general. So I think that's really important to me. And I hopefully, hopefully people leave with that impression. Well, it sounds like it's a place that we all need to put on our um, our list of places to go in the next, not a bucket list because it needs to happen before then, but definitely on our list of places to visit. Um, I love the interactiveness of it. And I think one of our, um, one of my colleagues did visit there recently. And I think she was talking about the fact that you can get a download of the image of this, of the music that you've heard in the, in the museum that you've really enjoyed. And I love that sort of aspect of it, but um, she, she just said that she really enjoyed the whole experience. So it is now definitely on my list. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about the museum and to talk to us about some of the um, artists and stories that are focused in there. We have had some busy busyness going on in the chat. So I'm gonna hand over to Tony to sort of go through that and tell us some of the comments and questions. And um, I know I have one more question, but I'll let other people go first. So that's my own personal question. <laughs> Well, yeah, so this has been such a wonderful conversation and just sharing a few things in the comments here. Um, someone says it's the stories that attracts listeners today talking about um, your earlier, whenever you were talking about the museum itself. And one question here asks, does your museum deal with the shape note tradition of African-American music, such as Dewey P. Williams in Ozark, Alabama? No, we specifically don't. I think that, I think there are aspects of uh, like shape music and also heart music. I think that, so I we do do a good job of talking about certain aspects of certain people's contributions. Like we talk about the Dorsey's so much as far as their contributions to the initial stages of uh, gospel and sacred music, but we do need to become better because I'll tell you right now, uh, it's so often that we get opportunities where people ask like, why isn't this person in music? Or why is this person in music? So we're at a place right now where we are often asking, hey, tell us what we're missing. And hopefully we can include in our, and I'll do a promotion right now, our soon to uh, be established uh, digital exhibition space. So we want to continue to expand on what we are talking about in the museum, especially having genres such as rock and roll and country music in those subgenres being recognized and also showing this ongoing recognition of uh, developing narratives of stories in these areas. Yeah, and we have a lot of great comments that kind of followed along with your conversation. So we don't really have any more specific questions. Um, so I'll just encourage our listeners or anyone tuning in, if you have a question, please go ahead and drop it in the chat, but just sharing a couple more comments. Um, Z. Lawrence says, we would love to expand the work and connection between Columbus, Georgia and Nashville, Tennessee with the National Museum of African American Music. Uh, Ma Rainey, Mother of Blues. Ma oh, Rainey, really? yeah. So, so my parents retired in Columbus, Georgia, so I know a lot about uh, the museum and all, uh, yeah, so Liberty Theater, so yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. We've got a lot of friends on here from the International Country Music um, Conference tuning in as well. Uh, Gregory Hansen, he's got a long comment, but I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, Gregory Hansen says, one of the clubs in Jacksonville was called Airdrome. It was on Ashley Street in La Vila. In 1910, a musician named John H.W. Woods played a ventrilo ventriloquist act with Little Henry. In the printed sources, it's possible the little Henry was one of the first 
to be identified as a blues musician. Another contender for the first billed blues singer was Estelle Harris based in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Around 1910, she played in Memphis at a club called The Savory. Um, it's now a parking lot for the minor league Redbirds. So, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hanson. I appreciate it. That was one of my uh, major uh, mentors in college, and I appreciate it. He knows he is one of my heroes. So <laughs> thank you for continuing to enrich me. Uh, and um, just sharing a few more comments here quickly. Um, Donna Hartman says, don't forget about the Tennessee Chocolate Drops, Howard Louis Bluey Armstrong, um, the annual Louis Bluey Festival celebrates his life um, and it's taking place on September 30th in Carryville, Tennessee. I've been to that. It's a fantastic, wonderful festival. Well, and um, also um, the Tennessee Chocolate Drops were one of the acts that recorded down in East Tennessee in the, in the late 20s, early 30s. So there's a nice connection to this area with their recording at some of those sessions. Welcome. And then we have someone else, uh, Thomas Peterson just said a uh, Hank Mobley, dropped that name in the chat there. And James, hey James, um, James <laughs> Atkinson says a uh, McDonald Craig of Linden, Tennessee could be well worth incorporating into your museum, particularly from the country music dimension. And we also have Josh White, uh, Detroit is another name suggestion there. So I think that's it for the chat. <laughs> There's a lot of people who have some some heroes that they they want to share. Yeah, Ooh. thanks for for um, being so interactive, everyone listening today on this conversation. So appreciate that. Yeah, and David Winship just um, noted that the Tennessee Chocolate Drops um, was the name used in race records, but they were called the Tennessee Trio when they were um, put into the hillbilly genre or, or marketed in that way. So that's interesting. And Gregory Hansen, did you see his comment, Tony? <laughs> yes, there's two Renee Rogers on this chat right now. Um, <laughs> and, and they're both, they're actually me and Tony, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, I th I, I've been writing down all sorts of notes while you've been talking, Brian, about ways that maybe we can work together, so. <laughs> but awesome. I, I did have an, another question. Um, and it's, it's really about your visitors, because one of the things that I think, and Tony, you can probably attest to this too, because you, um, Tony started out working on our front line, so she knows firsthand how the visitors interact with us, is that because we're a music museum, we get a lot of nostalgia playing into our visitors' experience of the museum. So they're learning to learn, learn they're really excited to explore the history and to make those connections about what you were talking about, but they also really um, have very specific and sort of emotional memories attached to the music that they're hearing when they're in the museum. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you all, like the, pe the people who are on the gallery floor out there interacting with those visitors, do they have that same experience of people wanting to talk to them about why they love this song or how their grandfather played this music or that type of thing because we get that a lot we do i think with the i think the one of the best interactives where people want to have discussions is roots and strings so that is the connection to artists to artists and oftentimes i remember what was it saturday afternoon there was an older lady in a wheelchair and she spent like an hour just listening to music, dancing, and then talking about her childhood as far as the songs that she remember as a child, her uh, 60s and 70s. So I think, or 60s, when she was, yeah, I remember she was like seven years old. So the point was, everyone has their own experience with music. And it's not often, and I, and I like the aspect, we're in COVID era, but I like the aspect where people can put on headphones, but it's very personal experience in this big space. And I think that's important where oftentimes you're not having a discussion because I've seen people sitting in a corner, they're crying. And I think that's the thing to realize where everyone is trying to interpret the experience their own way. And there we do have those discussions where someone wants to give their personal experience with especially with our liaisons we call it uh, Rios. 
and they have these discussions where it's very personal. But I truly appreciate when they're having their own moment um, at these interactives and really getting a deeper understanding of why this is so important to them. I think that's something that makes being in a music museum very, very special, actually, because it music connects in so deeply. And, you know, they talk about the way music is really important with dementia patients, for instance, and that it can help them to, to interact with and bring up those um, memories and stuff. So I think, yeah, it's an emotional, personal thing with music. And that's pretty exciting when you work in a music museum. Absolutely. So I think that's all. I don't know if we've gotten any more questions since we were just talking, but I think that um, this has been, for me, a wonderful conversation. I hope for our audience, uh, certainly from the, the level of interaction we got with people jumping in with comments and, and questions and ideas. Um, it's been a great evening with you, um, Brian. So I just, I want to say thank you to Dr. Brian Pierce for this wonderful talk. Um, thank you to all of our audience for being here with us. Um, Z Lawrence asked if, um, we could connect you and he together um, for to talk about other things. And I'd be happy if if, if that's okay, I'd be happy to provide that connection um, tomorrow when we're back in the office. Um, yeah, and I also saw that Alma Douglas, who is our, our Smithsonian affiliation liaison officer, she's the person that, that we work with as a Smithsonian affiliate. She said, it's great to see two museums optimize the opportunity to connect and showcasing the impact of the stories they tell and the wonderful cross connections that, that exist. So that's been wonderful to see Alma on here with us. Hello, Alma. <laughs> nice to meet you, Alma. Yes, well, so thank you to everyone. Um, like I said, we'll be sending out an email in the next couple of days that'll have the survey. I'll be sure that we have the, the Vanderbilt Black Cowboy Project link and um, some other things, a link to Brian's museum on there. Um, and I'll encourage everyone to go visit that museum in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but let me, before we let, before everyone goes, let me tell you just a few things that are happening um, with the museum over the next couple of weeks. Um, this week on Thursday, August 10th at 7 p.m., we have Farm and Fun Time with S.G. Goodman and Vivian Riley. Um, I believe we still have tickets available for that live Farm and Fun Time show, but if you are not with us, you can watch that live on Facebook. So do check us out there at 7 p.m. on Thursday. Saturday, August 12th, we have from 2 to 5 p.m. our Country Jam. Saturday, August 26th, from 2 to 5 p.m., we have our Bluegrass Jam. Then Monday, August 28th at 6.30 p.m., we are doing a film screening um, of I've Endured the Music and Legacy of Ola Bell Reed, followed by a virtual Q&A with the filmmaker Bill Shoebridge. That is a program to go along with our Women in Old Time Music exhibit. And then just a reminder that there is no speaker sessions in September because it, interact, it intersects with the same week that we have Bristol Rhythm and Roots reunion here. And Tony and myself and Erica will all be run off our feet that week and exhausted. So we do not do the speaker sessions in September, but we will back, be back here on Tuesday, October 10th, 7 p.m. with ballad singer Donna Ray Norton talking about sing, talking about and singing murder ballads with us. So that will be a, a live in-person and virtual program. So put that on your calendars now. But in the meantime, again, thank you, Brian, for being with us. Thank you to our audience. And we're just glad that everyone was here with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Everyone have a great night.